So the first, all right, thank you. So the first uh, part is now going to be a debate. Um, for certain, this will be fun. Hopefully, it will be educational. Um, it's going to be, is it, it is appropriate to prevent RV dilation at all costs in severe PR. I am very aggressive on indication with, uh, with PPVI. Um, first, we're going to start with Zahid Amin as the pro, not as the professional, just going on the pro side. All right. Um, so, you know, usually debates are supposed to be a lot of fun, and you can make fun of your opponent and a lot of things. But I thought this debate is is sort of slam dunk. We all want to do the right thing for the patient, right? You saw Dr. Benson's amazing talk in the morning, and his first and foremost objective in that talk for us to learn from him was don't do harm to the patient. Right, so you you have to be you have to be prepared always, and you have to do the right thing for the patient. So I thought I'm going to present the data, and not make fun of Dr. Hijazi in any way, shape, or form. All right. In fact, in fact, I will show you one of my most favorite picture of Dr. Hijazi. This is about almost eight nine years old. We were in Russia at one the meeting, and and um, I love this picture. I took a picture with Greg Stone and his daughters at that time too. If you remember, those were fantastic pictures. So. And I have a lot of respect for him. We have worked together for six years at one point at Rush. So nothing against him. But now coming to the talk is you always, you know, the reason we have debates is because you want to look at everything in two ways, right? So if you look at this picture, uh, one of the princes, you know, if you don't see the lateral view, it looks like the prince is not happy and he's uh, showing you the bird or whatever you want to call it. But when you see the AP view, you know, uh, you see that actually you were saying there are three components of whatever. So, so we're going to clarify, you know, um, how it is. So we need to look at any subject, any topic in, in at least more than one way, at least two ways, right? Uh, very famous quotation, you, we all believe in this. Erasmus said that many, 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 many years ago, prevention is better than cure. And I 100% agree, agree with it. You know Angelina Jolie, one of the prettiest stars in the world, if you remember, she shocked the world when she had double mastectomy as a preventive measure uh, for cancer, which everybody was absolutely amazed. One of the most beautiful women in the world uh, decided, without any signs of cancer or anything, decided to have double mastectomy, okay? And similarly, if you look at, Dr. Carol is in the, in the audience, PF closure was initially indicated for patients who have had second stroke. After first stroke, we say, hey, it's okay. You have first stroke, you, you know, didn't suffer. Let's have you another one, and then we will try to think, treat you. And I think today we find out that that was absolutely absurd. That was not the right thing to do. In deep down, we believed in it, but we always said, ah, oh, we have to do the right thing. We have to follow the protocol and do the, do the right thing and not do this. Come back when you have second stroke. I mean, somebody tells that to me, I'm gonna to go to some different doctor, I'll be honest with you. But, so should we wait for symptoms before replacing pulmonary valves? That's the question, right, uh, for me. Should we wait for symptoms? Nowadays we are doing, we do the right thing, you know. Maybe it's industries push something that we should continue to put valves in the RVOT because they make money, we look good everything, or are we really doing the right thing? So I am confident that deep down all of you agree with the title I've been asked to debate on. Now what I need to do is gently guide all of you toward the right path, okay? We just cannot wait for the RV to fail before intervening when non-surgical approaches and simpler approaches are available and they seem to work well. This is uh, one of the papers that Dr. Hijazi wrote with one of his fellows, and this is a quote from this paper. There were two authors on this paper, and it starts with patients requiring RVOT reconstruction require multiple sternotomies. Management strategies have been based upon delaying surgical intervention for as long as possible, and then it adds, however, this approach carries the risk of delaying surgery beyond the point of irreversible RV dysfunction. <coughs> And we have really never cared for, for the right ventricle. In 1975, an amazing surgeon like Aldo Castaneda, which all of you know, if you're a pediatric interventionist or a surgeon, you know Dr. Castaneda. They wrote an article, The Dispensable Right Ventricle. 
Robert said, and Aldo Castaneda wrote an article, Dispenser Right Ventricle, and somebody quoted on this, RV function has not been investigated to the same extent as LV function, and consequently, it, its importance has been underestimated. And I, now I agree with that. At that time, they used to say, hey, it's okay. If the right ventricle fails, who cares? But suddenly, now we have tricuspid valve technologies, we have pulmonic valve technologies, and we are going forward. So let's look at the data, and I want to thank Dr. Chen, uh, from whom I borrowed some of this data. So question number one will be, does pulmonary valve regurgitation lead to progressive RV dilatation and dysfunction? So it's a patient has simply PR. Does it lead to? So if you look at this data from uh, N2UCH, um, effective PR on RV size with a p-value of 0 0.001 absolutely determines that, that in repair patients, patients who were repaired, tetralogy of fellow, you know, RV dysfunction and the PR fraction and RV size continue to increase. What changes occur? The PR fraction increases. The blue is over time or follow up. Our right ventricle and diastolic volume index increases. Right ventricle and systolic volume index, it increases. Ejection fraction drops. Right ventricle output tract size slightly increases, but statistically significant. All values are 0 0.001, okay? Left ventricle and diastolic volume index increases, systolic volume increases. So every bad thing is happening when we are following these patients who have severe PI, slowly and gradually, but hey, they are asymptomatic. We shouldn't be touching them. The oxygen consumption in these patients, again, the P for trending purpose is 0 0.01, absolutely gets worse over time. So we are making them suffer. So the question of our answer, does PR leads to progressive RV dilatation and dysfunction, you can absolutely safely say yes, there is enough data available to say that and to prove it, okay? Now question number two, does PR, RV dilatation and dysfunction determine adverse clinical outcomes, right? So if dysfunction happened, maybe he's still asymptomatic, nothing will happen to you, but will his outcome or her outcome will be adverse over time? If you look at this long-term survival in repair tautology fellow, it continues to decline way more than in general population, okay? And cause of death in these patients is heart failure, slowly and sudden death because of arrhythmias. Now, right ventricle hypertrophy, left ventricle dysfunction, atrial, tach <coughs> atrial tachyarrhythmias predict death and sustained ventricular tachycardia. And if you look again on this slide by Valentin's paper in 2014, patient without risk factor, patient who have RV mass over volume ratio more than 0.3, patient with RV mass volume more than 0.3 with, with low ejection fraction. As you see, there is a significant decline, significant decline in these patients' outcomes. So there are so many risk factors in the patients. For example, tetralogy fellow, which is the most common procedure where we put so many risk factors. The patient, they may have, they have had atriotomy. They have, have, may have had ventriculotomy. They have a BST patch closure. They may have transannular patch. They may have a BT shunt. So many risk factors, these tiny. But if you in, look at them carefully in this, pulmonary valve insufficiency for sure remains one of them. So some of them you cannot correct, okay? Ventriculotomy, if it was done and it leads to tachycardia, you cannot correct. But there are some things that you can correct. Pulmonary valve insufficiency without any question is associated with, uh, with, with significant morbidity and mortality. So does PR and RV dilatation and dysfunction determine adverse clinical outcome? Yes, indirectly it leads to that. Without any question, again, significant data published. The last question, does pulmonary valve replacement improves our long-term outcomes? That's where Dr. Hijazi probably is gonna catch me on. That, hey, there's no data that's going to improve. So I could tell you now. Forgetting the ASJ and ESC guidelines, if you look at the pre-PVR periodicals of favorable post PVR outcome with Bachma, Talgivas, Frigiola, and Osterhoff. If you see in this, these, all these results tell you that really there is not much change that occurs in them. So for example, um, if you look at the um, right ventricular and diastolic volume and ejection fraction normalization, it can only occur as long as in Bachma's paper if it's less than 80. In, to give us patient if it's less than 90, okay? QRS duration in Darl give us patient if it's less than 160, you may get improvement. Other than that, you may not get improvement. And I want to get to this in a second, what I mean by, by are we getting to, preparing this too late? I still have time, right? You have uh, another minute. Thank you. So I'm gonna bypass this. Changes are besides PR, 
So RV size, another question that he can raise is the RV size ultimately may get smaller, but again, patient over time, they can, RV dilatation s appears to recur in these patients. Okay, functional improvement after PVR absolutely happens. New York Heart Association classification, if you look at this, all these gray ones are gray, um, uh, NYHA class one, absolutely happen, but over time, it appears to, to, to slow down. If you have one minute, I will, I will pass, bypass this. So does pulmonary valve replacement improve long-term clinical outcome? Answer, perhaps. But it's sort of contradictory when we know that PR always leads to worsening symptoms, okay? So are we acting too late in replacing pulmonary valves? Should we change? Should we change these cutoff values that have been predicted by Tal Giva and Oosterhof? I think we should absolutely try to do that. We should also conduct multi-center registries with long-term follow-up to see really what happens to them. So we have to do patients who have free PI but and no symptom and then follow them <laughs> and see what happens to them. We have to be proactive versus criteria. We have to use a proactive criteria in asymptomatic patients and different criteria, conservative criteria in other patients to do that. So we should be able to do that. And with that, I stop. I don't want to take more time. So Dr. Hizazi won't say that I took too much time. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. First, thanks to the course directors for inviting me here. It's an absolute pleasure to be <laughs> with you after traveling 34 hours from Doha. <laughs> oh, gosh, what happened here? Uh, to, uh, to be with you, you know, Doha, Kuwait, Kuwait, Frankfurt, Frankfurt, Chicago, Chicago, Toronto, so you can count the hours. So I came from this nice medical center that we just actually, the hospital opened January 14 of this year, and the cardiac program, the cath lab in particular, was activated this Monday. So you can imagine how busy we are, and hopefully the surgical program July 1st. It's a great facility, and I'm still looking for a couple of cardiac intensivists and a non-invasive uh, echocardiographer. Now, this is a, a slide from just a couple of weeks ago in San Diego, Dr. Uh, Amin, along with Dr. Uh, Benson and Dr. Helen Brand and Dr. Vincent, the four pediatric cardiologists, received the MSCAI, Master of the Society for Cardiovascular Angiography Intervention. So congratulations to all of them. I have, however, so many slides and movies of Dr. Amin that if I show them here, he will be embarrassed, so I will not show them here. So this is my disclosure slide, and it's all about pulmonary valve replacement. So as physicians, we all have to dig this concept in our mind, first, do no harm. Transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement is the biggest probably procedure we do in our cath lab. So it has to be done for the right indication and the right patient. We all know what he showed that the pulmonary insufficiency is bad for the patient, and we all agree with that. It, you know, lead to heart failure and premature death. And we have seen from the surgical literature that surgical pulmonary valve replacement improve the functional class, improve the exercise capacity, reduction in the RV size, and decrease in the QRS duration. Now, this is a famous paper that looked at many patients in the Netherlands. This is by uh, Barbara Mulder and her colleagues. And they basically, they could look at what is the threshold that we should beyond which say that the RV will or will not come back to normal. And then basically, they looked at all sizes RV in diastolic volume index 200, 250, you name it. And in every patient category, the RV got smaller. But the RV came back to normal only when the RV in diastolic volume was about 150 to 160 ml. So that's the threshold where if you do it before that, you may normalize the right ventricle size. So all RV volumes exhibited reduction in size a threshold above which RV volume did not change was not identified. So the threshold that they identify that if you do it before is 160 ml, lower preoperative RV ejection fraction resulted in a greater increase in ejection fraction. So if your RV ejection fraction is normal before the valve replacement, 
most likely you will not actually result in any improvements. So you've got to wait until you start seeing reduction in the ejection fraction. Same for the QRS duration and the RV in diastolic volume. So delaying the surgical BVR results in irreversible RV dysfunction. Early one, early degeneration of the new valve. So if we do a procedure before these guidelines are met, we know that there is a finite longevity of these valves, sometimes five years, sometimes, if you're lucky, 10 years. And we have seen many patients where within a year, calcification and degeneration of the new valve, then you have to subject them for the same operation. So repeat operation after operation. Other factors that we should take into consideration, of course, as to the timing, if the patient has other confounding variables, such as arrhythmias, you know, and that can be, uh, you know, by halter and by uh, EKG, presence of symptoms, as well as, of course, other hemodynamic perturbances like uh, residual VSDs or TR. So let's look at the transcatheter, and that's why we are all here, because we are interventionists. Look at the guidelines that are published to date. So this is from 2011, the AHA cardiac cath uh, guidelines. It gives it class 2A recommendation, which is pretty weak, actually. The recommendation says it is reasonable to consider percutaneous pulmonary valve in patients with an RV to pulmonary artery conduit with associated moderate to severe pulmonary regurgitation or stenosis, provided the patient meets the criteria. So it did not even touch on what criteria were there. Then if you look at the AHA ACC guidelines 2006, the adult congenital 2008, and the uh, European Society uh, of Cardiology, this is the uh, newest recommendation, and you can look at it, that it gives it class 2A in there with level of evidence C, not even A. So the, and then if you look at this uh, uh, guidelines down here, again, it's 2A, 2A. So the, the really, the, the guidelines, which as cardiologists we all should go by, they do not give it more than this. So the current indications that we go by as cardiologists in most of our labs that if the patient has symptoms with severe PR, we all agree that these patients probably we should intervene on them. But as Zahid mentioned, majority of them are asymptomatic, so we need objective parameters to really take somebody to the cath lab because the stakes are so high with this procedure. And these indications are listed there, primarily the RV in diastolic volume, more than 150 ml per meter square, RV ejection fraction less than 40, and the regression fraction is less than 40, and people add electrocardiographic criteria, specifically the QRS duration more than 180 millisecond. So the proposed indications, they are listed right there at this slide. I'm not going to go over them. Uh, you know, we, we mentioned them. So you need to meet majority of these criteria so that if you encounter a complication in these patients, and we all do encounter complications, you will have a leg to stand on when you meet the parents or, of course, when you meet the lawyer. Right? So this is here, uh, Tal Giva uh, group in, in Boston, they looked at uh, uh, right ventricular remodeling after pulmonary valve replacement, early gains, late loss. What does that mean? They looked at all these patients that they put the valve in them and they followed them, and after seven years, guess what? All these valves, or majority of them, they got degenerated and calcified, and then what you gained at the beginning, you lost at the end. So you've got to have strong indication. And then this paper also by the uh, Tal Giva group and, and his colleagues, propensity score adjusted analysis of clinical outcomes after pulmonary valve. What does that mean? So they look, they, in some group, they were proactive. They uh, looked at, uh, uh, took these patients and replaced their valve when they met these criteria. And then the conservative uh, group, of course, higher volumes, higher in this, uh, systolic and ejection fraction. And then they basically found there was not much difference in the outcome in these patients, the primary outcome and the secondary outcome. And actually, those patients who they uh, intervened on, uh, you know, uh, proactively had more uh, adverse events. So my advice, you know, this is the uh, breakout of the trial. I'm, I'm not going to go through it. And you can see here uh, most of these patients are uh, on the right side of the midline. 
So basically, you've got to be pretty conservative when you decide to take a patient to the cath lab. Again, here, uh, another uh, paper by the uh, uh, Boston group, pulmonary valve replacement in the flow impact on survival and ventricular tachycardia. They looked at, does it really make a difference? And guess what the conclusion? Late PVR for symptomatic pulmonary regurgitation or visualization did not reduce the incidence of VTAC or death. And that's the primary indication that we do it for, to prevent the, the late loss in these patients. And this paper from a reputable center in Boston, they say that it did not. Impact of pulmonary valve replacement in tetralogy failure with pulmonary vegetation, a comparison of intervention and non-intervention. So their conclusion, the data indicate that patients with intermediate RV dilatation and severe PR are at low risk for significant progression in the short term, which can guide the interval for MRI imaging and advice to timing for future PVR. So take it easy and do not be aggressive when you decide to take. This is not like PDA closure with a small cord or small device and because the complications, and I can go over and over. So there's a lot of papers published in that. So for the interest of time, uh, I, I hope that I conveyed the message to you that the uh, timing of PVR has to be considered very carefully. Why? Because no matter what valve you use, Melody, Edwards, or other investigational valves, there are complications. This is the Melody uh, you know, uh, data indicated that there were significant complications, including stentive fractures, in, uh, infective endocarditis, and late reintervention. If you look at the five-year freedom from reintervention and explantation was only 76%. So 25% of the patients had re-intervention. Won't it be better if I delay the intervention in these patients until a later age so that maybe the time or the number of times that I need to re-intervene will be less? Remember, these patients, if they are children, you want them to live 50, 60 years. So three operations or three interventions is better than doing four or five interventions. Last minute, see. All right, the lack of improvement in exercise parameters suggests that in contrast to pressure overload, the contractile reserve of chronically volume overloaded myocardium <laughs> is limited. So again, they looked at their exercise capacity. Again, not much improvement at all. Again, this is a list of the potential complications of the procedure, stent fracture, coronary impingement, device embolization, paravalvular leaks, homograft rupture dissection, infective endocarditis, death. These are all serious potential complications. So you've got to take it easy. I'm going to put, uh, so to conclude, the appropriate time to replace the pulmonary valve is not yet known. We think it's 150 ml, but God only knows. Results of all these valves are good, and we like to do these procedures, but an advice, take the patient when they meet all criteria because of the stakes involved in this procedure. Thank you. So, okay, so I think what we're going to do is the following. I think we're going to open it up comments from the floor as opposed to a rebuttal. And who here would classify themselves as someone who favors early intervention for PR if you have a percutaneous option? Show of hands. And who would say that they are kind of, you know, over 160, over 180? Okay, so it seems like more. So you can't raise your hand twice. Oh, you you <laughs> did. <laughs> he's with both. He just. Oh, okay. He just wants to make sure he's not wrong. <laughs> I just wanted to know if anyone had any comments about this particular topic. Uh, that they uh, go ahead, Toby. Hello, does this work? Um, the, the indications for intervention being for similar physiology, we talk about patients that have had previous balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty, and so they don't have the ventriculotomy and yes. the VSD patch and all the other little things that you know go into their worse outcomes. 
and you'll see some of these kids that have old valvuloplasty and pretty severe yeah. PR. Are the indications the same? Are you as aggressive or I, more conservative? I use, I use the same indications. Uh, simply on this particular topic, we do not have enough numbers yet to judge whether if we intervene early or late will make a difference. You know, because the number of patients that we're doing, I mean, it's handful after pulmonary valvuloplasty. John. Z, if the durability of the valve was improved and the complication rate of the procedure was quite low, would you flip and say earlier intervention is indicated, although we need data, a randomized trial showing early versus waiting till simple well, onset? You, uh, let me first an answer uh, part of the question that you did. So we know surgical pulmonary valve is not good. You, you know, the outcome is not as good as transcatheter. So we believe transcatheter intervention is better than surgery. The question is, would I use this technology now or still wait? So until I have a device that I can 100% of the times take it to the target legion, 100% of the time retrieve it, reposition, just like an ASD or PDA, and then release it there, then I will lower my threshold. Until then, I will not take anybody to the cath lab until they meet all the criteria because simply we're living in a, first of all, litigious society, and second, it's not the right thing for the patient. I think, I think those are some very, uh, I think there may be some comments about Ziad's comments, but Zahid, why don't you go ahead? I mean, I, I, I don't think there's anybody in the room who can say that you can retrieve 100% of the time ASG device. I mean, it's not possible. You can never have a perfect result on anything. You should try to reduce the risk of complications, but there's no, we can say 100% I will avoid mortality, 100% I will avoid migration, so that's why I'm not gonna do this case because the risk of this is here. I, I, you know what I'm saying? I think if we continue to do that, we will have more options. We will probably make better devices, better valves, which will reduce the risk of complication. Initially, complications are always higher, but there is no, Procedure in my, even a cat, regular cat has some risk. So cannot have 100% survival, right? I mean, yeah, that's what I. No, I agree like, with you, but yeah. the TPVR has much more risks than PDS. Right, closure, right. ASD but same agree. thing with ASD closure was a 24 French sheath. In addition, one way it was done. Right now, we can do with a seven French sheath, for example. So, so over should, time, it changes. Uh, right? This should not stop us from doing what we are doing now to improve the technology, but right now there is some abuse of the indications for the procedure. I would say, you know, a failed pulmonary valve implant does not end in the operating room like 99% of the time. It's a delivery problem. You take it out, okay? So like that, it would be different if kind of like the end game was like, you know, you fail the procedure, you end up in an emergent. You know, I think all of us are very conscious of, you know, when you go for a redo operation as an emergency, that's the 100% thing we do not want, right? But I think that most failures of pulmonary valve replacement are not because, you know, we have a catastrophic complication, it's because we can't get the valve there. We can't get the precedent there. Yes. We need to switch to the neck. We need to change our strategy slightly. So, you know what I mean? I think the thing that really is uh, a real thorn is really the endocarditis risk. I mean, boy, endocarditis can be a very scary disease. You know, you lose somebody's uh, kid's kidneys or a young adult's kidneys in endocarditis, mm -hmm. you know, that's a huge problem. I think that's like really glaring as a, as a, as a problem. Go ahead. Simran was going to be next over here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I was just going to say one thing. I mean, I think comparing this to ASD closure, the one distinction with it is that when you close most ASDs, you're done, right? If you get past the procedural complication, you're not going to be going back for an additional ASD closure. You're not going to be going back for an That's additional right. procedure. With a transcatheter pulmonary valve, there, you will be going back. Most of these patients are from zero to 80 or zero to 100, but they're usually young. And so these valves will not last forever and you will need to do it every, even the best case scenario valve, 20 years, maybe most if of the time, lucky. if you're lucky, 
Sometimes it's three years in bad situations if they've had endocarditis. I mean, the surgical and bands, as, as you saw, the, the yeah. group in Boston, after seven years, That's right. so the I game think the, was lost. I think the issue is that if it, because of that, it behooves us to wait until it's absolutely necessary. That's the main reason. I think we can be slightly uh, softer on, 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 you know, to delay the, the procedure itself. But I want to tell you, when we, Zia as a PI and I as a co-PI started doing the pulmonic valve with, at Rush, in the first few cases we did, we changed our planning of how to do this because we did not know it. There was no publication at that time. There was nothing. We changed. First we said the wire in the right PA is good. Then we realized it was painful. Then we said the wire in the left PA is good. Okay, you know what I'm saying? So we changed only because we did it. Only because we did it. If you don't do anything, when you know it's the right thing to do, or when you know surgery is but bad, if you don't do anything, I'm not saying about the timing. No, no but just, do it at the right time. Right, right. If you, if you don't do it, you know, I mean, mustard sending 95% survival, arterial switch operation initially, when um, Jatina presented, it was 67% survival, and he got standing ovation. Because it was the right thing to do. So a lot of patients died at that time. I'm not saying we kill anybody. Please don't get me wrong. My point is we need to be innovative in, in slightly taking maybe shorter steps but towards progress than to back off completely. 